OK, so we're going to explore writing positive integers as the sum of distinct Fibonacci numbers. And we'll actually prove this is always possible to do. But first, let's just explore how to do this. So if we take a positive integer, let's say 50, we'll see how we can write this as the sum of distinct Fibonacci numbers. We know that we can't use anything from 55 and above. That would be too big. But we could start with 34. This is the biggest Fibonacci number we could use, and then see if we can use some smaller Fibonacci numbers to make up that remaining 16 needed. So if we were to add 21, that would be too big, but then we could add 13, so 34 plus 13 gives us 47. Then you can see we just need to add 3 to finish off, or we could even do this as plus 2 and plus 1, so we don't necessarily get a unique representation this way. And the same applies for other numbers as well, so we could write 6 as 1 plus 5, or we could also write this as 1 plus 2 plus 3. And 8 is particularly interesting. This actually has three different representations. So first of all, you could actually just write 8 as 8, because 8 is a Fibonacci number, so this does count as a sum of distinct Fibonacci numbers. We could also write this as 3 plus 5, or even write this as 1 plus 2 plus 5, giving us three different representations for the number 8. And at this point, it's really important to note as well, we're talking about distinct Fibonacci numbers, because if you allow repeats, you could just make any positive integer by repeatedly adding 1 to itself, which isn't particularly interesting to study. So how can we prove this statement that every positive integer can be expressed like this? Well, the idea is to use a proof by induction style argument. So just to explore how this will work before we'll state it a bit more formally, Let's imagine we want to show that every number between 21 and 34 can be expressed like this. So we can write these as 21, and then 22 we'll write as 21 plus 1, 21 plus 2, and so on up to 34 is 21 plus 13. So then we can think, if we have an inductive step that tells us that actually all of these numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to 13, can be expressed as a sum of distinct Fibonacci numbers, and we could just add 21 to all of these numbers, and this would give us a nice way of expressing all of these integers from 21 to 34 as a sum of distinct positive Fibonacci numbers. And we know that we don't get any repeats here because 13 is much less than 21. So we can see this works in this particular example. So all of these numbers, all the way from 1 to 13, are going to be made up of a sum of Fibonacci numbers smaller than 21. So we haven't used 21, so we can add 21 to all of those. So it's like this knowledge of writing all these integers from 1 to 13 as a sum of Fibonacci numbers allows us then to unlock this knowledge to write all of the numbers from 21 to 34 as a sum of distinct Fibonacci numbers. For our more formal proof, we're actually going to use a strong induction argument where instead of just assuming that the result holds for the previous integer, we're actually going to assume that this holds for all previous integers from 1 up to fn, the nth Fibonacci number. So here we're labelling them actually starting with f2 as 1, just because f1, the previous term, is also 1, so then the third Fibonacci number is 2, and so on. So the inductive hypothesis is that every integer from 1 up to the nth Fibonacci number can be written as the sum of distinct Fibonacci numbers. So for our base case, this is really easy to check, even up to f5, for example. Then we want to try and show that we can extend this now using this inductive hypothesis from fn plus 1, so the next number after here, all the way up to the next Fibonacci number, fn plus 1. And to do this, we can just write them like we did previously, where we have fn plus 1, then fn plus 2, and so on, all the way up to the next one, fn plus 1, which we can actually write as fn plus fn minus 1, because remember the defining feature of the Fibonacci numbers is that the previous two terms sum to give the next term. So fn plus 1 is actually the sum of the previous two terms. So here we need to add 1, add 2, add 3, and so on. And then to make this fn plus 1, the next Fibonacci number, we just need to add the previous Fibonacci number. So now we know from our inductive hypothesis that we can actually write fn plus 1 as we can write this fn plus, and I'll write this as s1, even though it's just the number 1, using this notation that we have a way of expressing 1 as a sum of distinct Fibonacci numbers. We can do the same for fn plus 2, 
we write as fn plus whatever our sum is to make 2, which is just again the number 2. But we can keep going like this all the way down to fn plus f of n minus 1, and we can write this as fn plus our sum which makes up f of n minus 1. And this is less than f of n, so this is less than the nth Fibonacci number, so we do know that this sum exists, expressing it as a sum of distinct Fibonacci numbers. And if you look at all of these different sums here, all of these sums are making up integers which are at most f of n minus 1, so the n minus 1th Fibonacci number. So because we know that f n minus 1 this is less than fn. We're not actually using the nth Fibonacci number in any of these sums because then the sum would be too big. So then this is telling us then we can actually just write all of these as fn plus whatever the sum was for 1, fn plus the sum for 2, fn plus the sum for 3, and so on, all the way down to fn plus whatever the sum was for fn minus 1. And this gives us then a nice way of writing all of these integers that we're interested in from fn plus 1 up to the next Fibonacci number as the sum of distinct Fibonacci numbers. So we know that we can just add fn to all of these previous representations as sums without repeating ourselves, without using any Fibonacci number twice. And this completes the proof at this point, because you can see this is going to work for going from fn plus 1 up to the next Fibonacci number, fn plus 1. Then we can do the same going from fn plus 1 plus 1, the next number up to fn plus 2, the next Fibonacci number after that, and so on. So this now generalises and extends to any positive integer. And now we'll finish with a nice payoff to this result, which involves a neat application of the Fibonacci numbers. So we can actually use the Fibonacci numbers to get an approximate conversion between miles and kilometres. So going from one Fibonacci number to the next goes from miles to kilometres. So one mile is approximately two kilometres, it's not a very good approximation, but as we go further in, 5 miles is approximately 8 kilometres, 8 miles is approximately 13 kilometres, and so on. So the approximation gets better as we go further into the sequence. And what's going on here is that 1 mile is approximately 1.6 kilometres. And if we think about the ratio between successive terms in the Fibonacci sequence, we can write this more formally as the ratio from the n plus 1th term to the previous term, this is also approximately 1.6. It's actually approximately the golden ratio, which is itself approximately 1.6. So going from 1 to the next is roughly like multiplying by 1.6. But we can actually make this a bit more formal by taking limits, because the limit, it turns out, as n goes to infinity of the ratio from one Fibonacci number to the previous one, this is actually equal to the golden ratio. So if we say that this limit is just equal to L, there's an informal way of seeing this, which is quite nice, because we can write this limit because f of n plus 1 can be written as the sum of the two previous terms. We can write this as fn plus fn minus 1, all divided by fn. And then we can write this limit as we've got fn over fn just gives us 1, splitting this up into two separate fractions. We have 1 plus the limit as n goes to infinity of fn minus 1 over fn. So now this is not the same as we had before. This is the previous term divided by the next term rather than the next term divided by the previous term. So if the limit exists, then this would be 1 over L. So you can start to see where this structure is coming from that we get the golden ratio, because if we're solving the equation L equals 1 plus 1 over L, then the solutions we'll get, we need to have a positive solution, so then the limit is going to be phi, the golden ratio, which is a solution to this equation. So we can't have a negative solution because we know this ratio will be positive from all the Fibonacci numbers being positive. So this result's great if you want to convert between any Fibonacci number of miles or any Fibonacci number of kilometres, but if you want to just convert between any integer number of miles and kilometres, well, we already know now that any positive integer can be expressed as a sum of Fibonacci numbers. So let's say we want to convert 70 miles into kilometres. Well, we can write 70 as 55 plus 13 plus 2. And then to convert this into kilometres, let's just take the next Fibonacci number after each one. So 55 is followed by 89, 13 is followed by 21, and 2 is followed by 3. 
So this gives us an approximation then that 70 miles is approximately, when we add all of these together, 113 kilometres. And it turns out that actually 70 miles, if we convert this, this is around 112.65 kilometres. So you can see this does actually give us a pretty good approximation then, converting between miles and kilometres.